This is Nathan Tabor with Handling Life. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And I've got a really um, special guest today, uh, Brother uh, Haltree. He's the pastor over at Kerwin Baptist. Um, he's a, a husband and a father, but he's also a really good friend. And I really appreciate him taking his time out to uh, come and join us. Uh, Brother, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you, Nathan, for inviting me. I know we've been wanting to do this for a little while, and I love what you're doing, and, and uh, it's a privilege to get to be here. Yeah, these are um, interesting times. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, interesting is the word, isn't it? You know, it's, um, it's amazing how the Lord um, works in things and can use things, uh, just seeing like digital stats, um, the number of church online viewership and right, sharing right. of Christian materials and Bible verses is up like five, six, seven, eight thousand times. Right. Um, you know, so it's pretty unique, right? Because people are getting to, to share where they, because normally if you're at work eight, nine, ten hours a day and come home and deal with the kids and deal with everything else, you don't have a lot of time to post something about your relationship with God online. Well, you know, I would say a couple of observations about that. Um, number one, I think, you know, what we're going through uh, is, has impacted all of us. And it's a reminder that we are not in control of things like we think we are sometimes. And that, you know, some things like this happen and it just reminds us that God uh, can take control of anything at any time. We're just not uh, in control like we think we are. You know, the second thing I would think is this, that God can certainly take something that is negative in many ways and make it a positive. And um, I think that um, really the fact of so much uh, material and encouragement and preaching and, and all these things are, are, are going out uh, in such great numbers now, God uh, might really be using this, uh, which I think he is, um, really to further his gospel in an even greater way. Now, how this might adversely affect uh, churches, local churches, you know, it, that remains to be seen. After the dust settles, do people kind of get out of the habit of going to church and different things? You know, that remains to be seen. But I, I will say that God has certainly worked some miracles. And, and then the third thing I would say is this. Social media is, um, of course, um, and we're on it right now, and thank God for it. Um, it can be used for good or bad. We know that just like anything. But I think what's interesting is that so much of Bible and preaching and encouragement and all those things that have been going out on the online circles and social media. I think that part of it too is there's not been as much criticism of each other, gossip of each other, because we've had to limit our social distancing. You know, it, it, it would be that a person would get on and they don't like what somebody's done or somebody said, and they're going to start posting about all that. And, um, you know, we find that we've got to basically spend a lot more time at home and limit those things that it's kind of limited the bad news and limited the criticism of each other that can sometimes go on on a venue like social media. And um, it, it's kind of halted some of that. Now that still goes on, but I think that it has kind of stopped that and opened the door for good news to get out there. And uh, of course, I know there's still some of the other also, but I just find that interesting because as a pastor, I would always, Every month, I've got three or four instances of people that are kind of mad at each other because somebody posted, said something about them and disagreed with whatever, you know, you know, that kind of a thing. And that's taken a back seat. I've just not heard any of that because our whole lives have been stopped, that it's kind of, uh, kind of, I guess, um, gotten rid of some of the stuff that's just petty and unimportant. And it's kind of made us focus on what is important. So I think God's used that in that way. Hey, I mean, that's a, that's a, a good point there of like, what's the most important things? Is it that somebody sat in my seat at church or somebody <laughs> sang a song I didn't like? Or is it that, hey, there's this bigger thing going on? So that's a good, that's exactly. a really, I hadn't thought about that. That's a really good point. Exactly. Well, you know, I think that it just goes to show that sometimes, you know, um, and this isn't a, you know, again, we're using social media right now. It's a wonderful thing. And God is, thank God for it, because I, I think of the challenge we as churches would have without it. But you know how that sometimes um, something that could be good or bad, it can kind of really open up the door for the, the dark side of ourselves, where uh, we now have a voice and we now can just say something, put it out there. Even at times, we don't even have to take, you know, accountability for it. We can just kind of criticize and get our little feelings out. 
but something like this, I think, has just kind of limited that to a degree. And um, now it's just so much churches online, doing things online. We've certainly done things online. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that, again, God's brought some good things out of this, despite the frustration and the difficulty it is for many. What well, is, and you know, the uncertainty, but, you know, you made a point earlier about families and time. I've lived in the same neighborhood since 2001. And any given Saturday, driving out, I got to drive by about 80 houses. You might have seen one or two families out playing some right. ball or riding a bicycle or that. But now, you know, pretty much any time you go out, there's 20, 25, 30, if it's a nice day like it is today, out drawing, you know, chalk on the, the, the driveway or throwing That's a baseball right. or shooting hoops or riding a bike. So whether we wanted to or not, we've had to realize that money and that building the business and, and growing at the job has had to take second seat to, you know, spending exactly. time with your family. Exactly. And, and, you know, this has been an opportunity probably for a lot of us, and I mean us, to see how bad we missed it and how um, important this actually is. Um, this has been in some ways, really a blessing uh, to my family and myself. Um, I don't want that to sound selfish, like, you know, as if God did all this just for me. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the more time at home, the more time with family. I have three young boys, and um, it's, it's a reminded me, a person in ministry that's gone most nights of the week and, and during the days of the week and all that, that, man, I, I miss this, and, and this should be my top priority. And it doesn't mean that there isn't times we have to go and minister and do things, but um, I think this has been a, a kind of a, a, a stop and reset button for me. And I think for a lot of people, I think that we all need to kind of say, hey, when things get back to normal, which I don't think things will ever be what they were before this happened. Um, I, I think that certainly the dangers might begin to phase away, but I really think that this has really changed culture a little bit. And um, in some ways good, probably some ways bad, but I, I do think for me and even for the church I pastor, um, I, I think we live in a world where on social media, we're finding what every church is doing, what everybody's doing. We think, man, I got to do that. And that sounds great. I got to do that. And, and, oh, hey, I need to start doing that. And, I, and, and before long, it can almost become a uh, competition to keep up with each other. And I think that if nothing else, this has kind of reminded me as a pastor that, you know, wait a minute. While we need to minister and get the gospel out, um, maybe there are some things that it would be better for my members to spend some time as a family together than to gather at the church every day for five weeks for something. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's wise to reassess um, and say, you know, what is needed? What is what serves the purpose of a church? And what is just add-ons to try to say you're better at this than some other church? You know, what is really important? What is, what is God really using? And what is just stuff we've added because we wanted to add it? And so I think it's, it's been a good chance to reevaluate a lot of things. Yeah. Well, you know, and you probably know the, this better than, than I as far as who, who wrote them and stuff. But do you remember in the, the 40s and that when churches started putting antennas on top of the church to broadcast their messages on the radio Right. I've, I've looked back on Google and seen the old articles of, well, there's Satan's tail sticking out of the top of the church. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, uh, how many millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people have come to know the Lord through, you know, your radio program or Billy Graham or Ro you know, Adrian Rogers or any of D.L. Moody, all of those who have used radio to share the gospel. Imagine that had that not been made available and the kind of the same opportunity exists today with social media online. Exactly. Exactly. Well, yeah. And I'm the first to say, um, you know, our church is one that, you know, we've had a TV broadcast for years and I mean years and, you know, we're not, a, we're not a, a large church, uh, you know, uh, on a scale with some others to do, but, you know, we took criticism as a church that, uh, Oh, we're trying to, you know, try to get everybody else's people because they're broadcast and a T, you know, I remember the days when Jerry Falwell uh, was one of the first ones to use TV broadcasts. Everybody would tune in and listen to, um, you know, the old time gospel hour and stuff. And, and you know, I remember uh, Rex Humbard. Some of you would remember him and things and just these different. It was so rare that a lot of preachers were on there. And nowadays, 
technology has made it where even just small local churches can put on to a broadcast. And of course now with the internet and, and I just imagine how many pastors criticized um, all social media. I mean, just, it's all of the devil, you know, and then now uh, as of a few, two or three weeks ago, they're now on it using it for their services because they've got no other choice. So, Wait, um, isn't know, it of the de- did you did you text him and say, wait, isn't this of the devil? Yeah. What are you doing here? <laughs> well, if I wasn't a pastor, I might would have. And of course, yeah. I'm sure years ago they criticized air conditioning when they came into churches and talked about how evil it was to put air conditioning in. And and I actually have personally preached at churches that they felt it was wrong um, to have an organ in a church. Um, you know, they were okay with a piano because it didn't have to be plugged in, but an organ was electric and that was wrong to have that and that that stuff doesn't make sense to me but we all have our things and uh, you know it's uh we we can get stuck on stuff that really doesn't matter in the bible but it's our tradition so we kind of take it and run with it but you know like i said god doing allowing i'm not saying necessarily that god but god allow this um i'm going to tell you it's just a reminder wait a minute it, it doesn't matter my preferences and it doesn't matter my this or that uh, we got to get right back to the bare essentials of how to minister, and I think it's been good for us. Well, you know, you say that word, and I ju- had just written that down, tradition. You know, I find myself even in my own walk with the Lord of like, well, if I've done this, if I've gone to church, and I've, I've you know, put my money in the, in the offering plate, and I've mm-hmm. said my prayers, you know, I'm good with God. Right. And sometimes it's good to have that tradition, you know, shake it a little bit and say, you know, it's not about going to church and church is good to go to. It's not about singing this one song. It's not, it's about what does God's word say? And then church becoming part of your walk with God, not just your walk with God. Sure. And, you know, of course, when the local church was founded and, and of course in the book of Acts, as we've been given that model uh, to follow, you know, Lord has made it clear um, to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. So we know that's part of God's plan, but there's a whole lot of people going to church, sitting there with bitter attitudes, cold heart, um, as far away from God as you could possibly get to, but they're sitting in church. And so going to church doesn't do one thing for you. Going to church really should just enhance what you're already doing on your own time and your walk with the Lord. If you're not walking with the Lord, you know, in your private time day to day, you're not going to walk with the Lord at church either. Um, a pastor can't say something that all of a sudden now you're going to have a walk with the Lord. Uh, we, we go to church because we're walking with the Lord already. We don't go to church to try to start walking with the Lord. Yep. That has are you to be saying just because basis. I, are, are you saying just because I uh, come to your church, are you telling me that I'm not the super Christian because I hear you preach? Absolutely not. I, yes, absolutely. I've been, I've been wasting my time for the last four years. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, a lot of people have. And, uh, you know, honestly, if a person comes to church to hear the preacher, they've already kind of missed the whole uh, point of it anyway. Um, we all come to church, including the preacher, to hear what God has to say. And, uh, you know, if, if a pastor's not seeking God's face and, and trying to not just put together a sermon, but a message from the Lord, um, you know, you've, we've missed the whole point anyway. Um, it's just become a social gathering, and um, that certainly wasn't what God intended the church to be. And, um, you know, he, the, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It, it, it. This is his church. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's not anybody else's church. And, you know, everybody is okay with it, so there's something that they wish was different. And then they want the pastor to change that. But if it's something they like, they get mad if the pastor changes that. You know, it it isn't about what really I want or desire or what they want or desire. It's every local body of believers. God is going to move them and sanctify them and and raise them and grow them and mature them as God sees fit. And it's the church's job to let God have control of that. And though none of us have the answers for all that, that, that's, uh, that's absolutely for sure. But I think the mistake is sometimes preachers give this illusion that they've gotten this all straightened out, settled. They got all the answers for everything. And uh, it's, it's time for the members to catch up to them. And uh, that's just an absolute lie. In my opinion, we're all growing together. I've got issues. You've got issues. We all got issues for me to give any kind of a, a hint that anything other than that is the case, then I would be uh, giving this false um, image of myself. I struggle. I sin every day. And, um, 
you know, I got things that I know I shouldn't do and I battle with it, my flesh. We're all in this together. So we all come to church to hear from God. I don't come to church so that you can hear me and you don't come to church so that you can hear me. We come to church because we need to hear from God and God deals with hearts corporately different than he does individually. So I've got to have my personal walk during the week because God's going to point some things out to me during the week. But I need that corporate um, worship time because God deals with our heart differently all through the scripture. God would deal with men like Moses and David. He would deal with them differently in the prayer closet than he did in corporate meetings. You know, you're making the point about um, you sharing you're no different. And I just want you to know, and I'm, I'm sure I've told you if I haven't, I, I, I should have, that I really appreciate your heart of, of sharing that, you know, you're no different than anyone else. You're a sinner right. saved by the grace of God, and you've got your faults and you've got your issues. Because, you know, a lot of times when you go into a church, not all, but some, it's like, ooh, you can't talk to him. You can't, you know, approach the pastor. He's holy. Yeah, that would and that would be that would be funny to think about that. That it, uh, you know, if you, you've met pastors like that, right? I mean, you've walked into a room and and know yeah. that person is there. Like the congregation never hears anything that they they've done wrong. They never talk about their their personal right. failures or their issues. So it's like, well, I want to be like. Mike, you know, but you never can right. be because you're never going to reach that. So then you kind of get discouraged in your walk with God because it's like, why can't, why can't I be that good of a Christian? Sure. Well, and I, I think too, those, those kind of guys, yes, they do exist, Nathan. Uh, I will say, I think maybe in a good way that um, we're getting less and less of that. I think that's a dying off thing. Uh, at least I hope it, it should have died off a hundred years ago, but um you know, I think that those guys tend to think that not only do they have the answers for everything, but they tend to be manipulating type of preachers that um, kind of that presenting themselves as better or um, a better Christian is a way to manipulate the people under them um, that you need to listen to me because you're, you're struggling with stuff I'm not struggling with. It's just kind of a, a manipulation. I don't even think they mean to, or maybe they don't even know that they're doing that, but you know, but it's not just preachers that do that. I know husbands that do that with their wives and vice yeah. versa. People that with their friends at church or whatever, they, they give that same illusion. They, they have this attitude for some reason that God's called them to be everybody's policeman and that, you know, they're just an inch above everybody else. And unfortunately, that's what's hurt church over the years. The sinners like me haven't, we aren't the ones that have hurt the church. It's the people that act like they're not the sinners that have really hurt church over the years. Yeah. Well, like, oh, you know, that person, just by the way they look, um, there must be something really wrong with them. So I don't need to share the gospel with them because they got tattoos sure. all over their arm and, a, you know, a nose ring or their hair's long or something. And it's like, right. Those, those are the people that we, as Christians, um, should be approaching. We should be trying to to get to the unsaved, whether they're clean cut and have a suit and tie on or a nice dress or, you know, look like somebody out of Woodstock. We should be sharing the gospel with everybody, not with just the people who we think we would like. Exactly. Well, you know, I think something that our churches have been guilty of over the years, and I'm certainly not a person that ever minds talking about how we have failed because I think we ought to be, we ought to be willing to admit while I believe that, you know, I'm in church because I believe the church has done far greater things than the mistakes that it's made, but church has made a lot of mistakes. And one of those is, is we've created church with an insider mentality. Um, it's that we're a group and you've got to earn your way into this group. And we've kind of made church about saved people where church should be for unsaved and saved people. And um, we, we've just tried to kind of make this thing, e even the way we use our terminology, we use words that only insiders would know and only insiders would know what they mean. And, um, you know, I think over the years, people have just grown weary of that, that, um, you know, if I'm made to feel like an outsider, the moment I walk into this place, then I don't need this place. And, and let's be honest, nobody really needs our place what they need is the Lord. 
And um, so, but I think that Satan sure used a lot of Christians to keep people away from Christ. You know, and I, I know that happens in the church, which is the building, but then the church who is made up of, of the believers, we do that to people at work. We do that to people at the gym. We do that to our neighbors. We're like, oh, we're, we're better because we're Christians. Yes. And so we kind of shun people and right. kind of, you know, throw them some hate. And the Lord's really worked on me and, and continues to work on me. Like, hey, how can you share the gospel with somebody if you're not sharing the love of Christ? Right. Right. Well, and I, and I think really you're not sharing Christ if you're not sharing the love of Christ, um, because then you're not really sharing who Christ is. Um, you know, even Jesus said that the only way people are going to know that you're my disciples, he said, is if you love one another. And so, you know, really that's, that's the problem with religion. And of course, I'm not a fan of religion and that sounds weird because I'm a pastor, but religion never helped anybody. Um, you know, the Bible, God's word, the truth is what shall make us free, not our denomination. <laughs> a denomination doesn't do one thing for you. Um, so, but it, you know, in other words, there might be some wonderful things and convictions and truth in denominations, but if the love of Christ isn't what's coming out, it doesn't mean that we can't, you know, say, call sin, sin, and tell, you know, sometimes the truth isn't popular, but the Bible says, speak the truth in love, and if we don't speak the truth in love, then we're not showing the love of Christ, and if you don't show the love of Christ, then you're really not showing Christ, and um, that, that's you know, the key so, right there is love. Yeah. It's yeah. it, Christ's love. It's God's love. It's take a stand for this issue or that issue. But if you're not doing it on God's word and in his love, in then his it's love, judgmental. Right. It's judgmental. It, it pushes people away. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it makes no sense. It's like bombing. It, it's like bombing an abortion clinic. People are against abortion. And, of course, we believe the Bible teaches against that, obviously. But the Bible also teaches against killing innocent people. <laughs> And so, you know, it, it, that, that's not showing Christ. That, that is the furthest thing away from Christ. And we have a generation now that's just, they're too smart to swallow that junk. And, um, you know, they're not going to care how much you know, we always say, till they know how much you care. And, um, you know, we, we've got a lot to learn on that. Um, there's that fine line where I don't compromise, but yet I show the love of Christ and all that. And, um, you know, we have failed in that area. I, I just think you take a broad spectrum of religion. You know, we failed in that, um, you know, and, and, and let me just say this, just agreeing with people and just telling people, oh, everything you're doing, it's okay. That That's not love either. Um, you know, a parent isn't, a parent really doesn't love a child if they don't ever correct them. I mean, if a parent decides that, you know, hey, I'm going to let my child do whatever they want to do because I want to just love them. Well, well, they're, they're doing that child a disservice. They're not showing love because they're not making that child into everything that that child needs to be. You know, I, I, I've always talked about it this way. If I have a dog that I love and he's my pet and part of my family, and he has a tendency that if I don't have him on a chain, he's going to start running after cars. Well, I know that that dog is in danger of killing himself. So I might put him on a chain or on a leash when I go out. Now, we think leash, well, you wouldn't put a leash on something that you love and, and you put that dog on a chain. Listen, I don't put that dog on a chain because I hate him. I, I do it because I love him and I don't want him to get hurt. And so, you know, I think that God's word is misunderstood sometimes. It gives us principles to live by because God loves us. He's trying to protect us from ourselves. So we've got to be truthful about what it says. But the whole purpose of why we're sharing that should be because we love people and we know God loves them. So that's why we've got to tell the truth. But it, it almost seems as if sometimes in religious places that people want to tell everybody how wrong they are. And it almost looks as if they're enjoying it. And I'm going to tell you as a, it's like they, they get some thrill out of just ripping somebody apart. As a pastor, uh, if there's times, sometimes I've got to, I got to teach the whole counsel of God and I've got to talk about sin sometimes. 
And I, it just kills me because I don't want to hurt any of my people. I don't want them to misunderstand. And um, I'm probably a little more gentler than the average, but you know, even if I, if I have to mention some things, I mean, I feel like running and, and getting in a corner after because I don't enjoy doing anything that might hurt our people, but I just know some, it just seems as if they just love raking somebody over the coals. They just enjoy that. And I just don't understand that. Well, but, but they're doing it out of love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But they don't need it, to love doing it. That's the <laughs> yeah. Well, I like your I like your dog analogy, and 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 as a good analogy, I add it's like the thought as you were saying that yes, you put a chain on to protect, but then on the other side you have a nice shelter and you have water and you you let the dog in the house and you love it and you pet on it and you take it for right. walks. And he doesn't so stay on the chain. He doesn't stay on the chain. He's not. It's not a three-foot chain around a tree that the dog, yes, you're protecting it from safety, but then you're punishing it because it's a dog. That's right. You know, he spends some time on my lap, too, and I feed him, and I pet him, and I enjoy him, and, and, and all those things. And, and that's what I'm saying It's you know, sometimes the leash is necessary and the chain is necess necessary, but, man, I'm not loving my pet if I just, all I ever do is leave him on that chain. I don't ever, I don't ever do anything for him or, or spend time with him. That's not love either. And so... Um, you know, restrictions sometimes is a way to show love because, um, you know, it, it's for that person's good. But at the same time, I don't think that any of us should enjoy inflicting pain or hurt on anybody, especially trying to use God's word to do it. You know, we can speak the truth in love, but some people like to use the Bible as a weapon and, and they, you know, they're wanting to abuse people under the umbrella of God's word and that's taking God's word out of context and it's dangerous to be honest with you. You know, so growing up and until a few years ago, I really had that thought in the, the process of, well, I've got to serve God because if I don't, this, this, and this bad thing is going to happen. You know, kind of the whack-a-mole. God's just sitting there ready to, you know, my actions better line up to his word. Um, and then I finally figured out that, well, if my heart's right, if I'm walking with the Lord, my actions will follow. I'll want to do right. So what do you say to the person who's in that mentality of like, oh, I've got to do these 17 things today or my relationship with God is not going to be where it is. And it's all, you know, it's, it's law based or it's action based. It's like, I must do this. And that, I think that's where you kind of get that judgmental attitude. So if you find, if somebody's there, what, what could you suggest to them a few things to, to look at to see what the true relationship with God should be like? Well, uh, Nathan, you know, very simply, of course, it took me years to learn the simplicity of it. But, um, you know, the Bible says to walk in love. And, um, you know, everybody, we're going we're gonna to do something for a motive. There's a reason why we're going to do something. And when it comes to serving God, um, you have three choices and, and really it's all centered in those three choices. You can do it out of obligation based. You can do it out of performance based, or you can do it love based and a performance based means I've got to perform. I've got to do these things. So God loves me. You know, sometimes preachers, they'll come across that way. They'll say that goodness gracious, you know, you got to do this. You got to do these things you know, and almost give this the way they put it is if God's going to love you more, if you do more of these things and that's performance based. And the problem with that is that you'll end up with resentment towards church and towards God, because you find out that all the performing you do isn't enough to pay God back and all the performing you do, it, it's not going to make God love you more. Then there's the obligation based. And this is even more dangerous because a lot of preachers will put this out. They'll, they'll say something like this, you know, now that God, you know, Jesus died on the cross for you. And because he's done all that, surely you should be willing to such and such. And if he did that, you should do such and such. And so what it kind of, and my analogy that I like to use is, is that it's almost as if when you got saved, God handed you a payment book and like, all right, I've, I've given you eternal life. So now you need to start paying me back. And, and what happens is church becomes the, you know, the bank and the pastor becomes the debt collector. 
And every time they come to church, they got to pay a little bit more of this debt that they, you know, and that breeds resentment because they find out that, you know, no matter what they do, it's not enough and never will be enough to pay God back for like dying predatory. on the cross for them. And I always predatory, tell people, predatory lending, saved, right? <laughs> yeah. When, when, when you got saved, God did not give you a payment book. You know, you, when you got saved, your sins were forgiven. He loves you. And, and you, that he loves you as much as he ever will. And so if you don't, do it out of performance based and you don't do it out of obligation based the only thing left is to do it out of love and that is that because god saved me no matter even though i can't perform even though i'll never be able to pay him back he loves me and now i just want to do what i do for him out of love and, and god's going to love you whether you do uh, you know 100 things or 50 things or 10 things he doesn't love you because of what you did he loves you because of what he did and now that ought to produce a reaction. And uh, when somebody shows me love, Nathan, it produces a reaction. Either I'm going to be appreciative for it, or I'm going to thank them for it, or I'm going to want to love them back. And so, you know, he loved us. I mean, we love him, the Bible says, because he first loved us. So that means that, that my loving him is a reaction to his love for me. Not because I feel obligated, not because I have to perform this. I love him because he first loved me. So that means before I could ever perform, before I could ever pay anything back, he loved me. And so now when I serve, I want to do it out of love, whatever that is, I want it to be out of love. And, and that's what I would tell people. I think a lot of times good people are doing good things out of wrong motives because they feel like they've got to earn God's love or earn God's favor. And it never works out that way. And they think that what they're doing is what they need to be doing because they've either been taught that or they think that, or they've heard that. <clears throat> what did you, when you finally figured that out, when you figured out, Hey, this is about the relationship with God. How did that change your well, entire it, life? Well, to me, it, it frees you up to be able to serve out of love. Um, you know, it, it, when I know that no matter what I do or, or ever will do, this person loves me let's say a given person. And I know it didn't matter what I would ever do to them. I know they love me. And the best way I could say it like this, Nathan is, you know, like my own mom and moms have a way to love kids when nobody else will love them. You know how that goes. But you know, I, it was a natural reaction for me. And even more as I grow older to love my mom and be more grateful for my mom, not because I feel like I, I have to do things to make her love me, and not because I feel like I ever have to pay her back for, you know, giving birth to me and raising me and changing my diapers. My mother never required me to pay her back for any of that. So that made me free to love her, to do what I do out of love, because I, there was no obligation and there was no performance um, driven uh, requirement. It, I was able to do it out of love. And so I think that, you know, we kind of do the same things. Yes, people are doing some of the things that they should and, and need to do. But the problem is if they're doing it out of the wrong motive, if they're doing it out of obligation or they're doing it out of performance, that's going to hit a roadblock. And what's going to happen is they're going to get, if they feel like they've got an obligation, they got to pay back salvation. They're going to realize they can't pay it back and they're going to get more in debt and it's going to resent. Now they don't want to come to church because every time they come to church, they feel more guilty for what they're not doing. Then the preacher gets up and makes them feel guilty for what they're not doing. So now it's just like a debt collector. When they start calling us, we don't want to answer the phone. And so they don't even want to go to church. Yeah. Well, not even go to church. They don't want a relationship. They don't want nope. anything to do with God because it immediately brings up this guilt. It right. brings up this inability and I know, you know, my own personal life uh, in the past and, and sometime now, but I'm more conscious to it of, well, if I do this for God, well, if I do this, then God should do this for me. Right. Well, if I do this and then God doesn't do this, well, God, why didn't you hold up your, you know, and you get into yep. this rationalization or this payback of God, I did this. Why didn't you do this? And it, it, it doesn't work because God might do it, but it would right. only be a coincidence. It's yep. not. It's not a, hey, God, I'm going to do this and then pray for you to, to do this. It, it's not a relationship that way with God. And that can That's be right. very frustrating. Yeah, well, the Bible, and the Bible makes it clear 
that God honors and blesses obedience. And so God gives principles in his word. And, and uh, it's what we call a cause and effect principle. Um, one verse that we often use in, is in Chronicles, you know, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek God's face, turn, then will I hear from, it's the if and the then. And all through the Bible, you'll find um, basically principles, promises that God lays forth and says, if you this, then I'll do this. And it's always God will bless, God will honor obedience. Um, that's always the principle. But the fact of that God will love me more or consider me more important or more valuable goes against the gospel and th th the gospel teaches the absolute opposite of that and it means that you know i can find principles in god's word i can obey them and and god will honor my life and you know nathan one one thing i would use as an illustration you know the bible gives clear principles that a man should not cheat on his wife and uh we know that and you don't even have to be a christian to know that that that's not a good thing but that's a biblical principle but it's it's when you obey that biblical principle god honors that but one of the reason god honors that is because by obeying that principle you prevented your own man-made hurt on your life and so a lot of things what god does people want to buck against it because they think it's a rule and the 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 simple fact is is that those principles are there just to save us from ourselves to keep us from sabotaging our own lives and um you know it's the fact of when we obey God, he honors it. But if God's given something to obey, he's got a reason that he put that in God's word and it's for our benefit. And so, uh, you know, yes, God honors obedience, but he doesn't love us more because of our actions or because of what we do or don't do. That's just against well, the gospel. Well, that's a good point on that is that we have in our lives, we have life, things that come along that we have no control over right. what others do or, you know, you never smoke exactly. and you get lung cancer or you're driving down the road and somebody rear ends you. But then you have kind of, as you know, and thank you for your endorsement of my, my book, the, the modern day Jonah type syndrome where you do something. You go cheat on your wife. You smart off your mouth to your boss. You run through the red light. You cause the consequence. It's right. not God. Right. Exactly. And, you know, and then what happens is we we proceed to disobey we cause the problem and then we get mad at God that the problem's in our life. Why would God let, why would God, why is God us? punishing why God, me? Yeah. Why would God do this to me? You know, and he gets all the blame and none of the praise. Yeah. You said something earlier, which um, I really liked. You were the, used the word simplicity. Um, it took me a long time on this and I'm still working on it, but the relationship with God serving him and obeying him is really a from a new testament side it's a really simple right command obey that's right well and and god gives a clear verse uh, i wanted to um, read this to you um second corinthians 11 verse 3 uh, it says this but i fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled eve through his subtlety so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Um, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. In other words, things were pretty simple in the Garden of Eden. And, and let me just say how simple they were because Paul brings this up. So let me just, he says, you know, even as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, everything was real simple in the Garden of Eden. Everything was perfect. You have access to anything there, Adam and Eve did. God said, just stay away from this one tree. And that's all God said. So you can't get more simple than that in life. You can do all this, just stay away from this one tree. And so that is simplicity. But Satan robbed Eve and Adam of that simplicity. Satan came in, told them lies, preyed on their emotions, all those things, temptation, all that. And before long, sin came into this world and death by sin, the Bible says. And so Satan is still doing that. He's trying to keep, he's trying to rob people, this verse says, of the simplicity that's in Christ. And the simple, the simplicity is this, is the gospel that, that literally it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the fact that he loved us enough that he came, he died, he was buried, he rose again, he defeated death, and he wants to save you. 
And it can't get any more simple than that. And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, get into God's word, try your best to obey it and apply it to your life. And God will take care of the rest. That is as simple as it can be. And yet, this, there's never been a time where Christians are more stressed and confused and, and swept around with every bit of wind of change and culture and all these things. And that's what, exactly what Satan has done. He's robbed us from simplicity. And usually, I think something like this coronavirus, it kind of begins the process of getting us back to simple things. Um, it means that, you know what, I don't have to spend time stressing how I'm going to get my son to basketball practice and get my other child to soccer practice and how I'm going to go here to get my hair done, how I'm going to get my hair cut, how I'm going to be over here, be at this meeting, be at that meeting. We stress our lives out. It's now gotten to, hey, what are we going to cook for supper? I mean, it, it, it's, 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 it's simplified things. And Satan hey, are, are has we, robbed us have, of that because that's what he did from the start. Are we going to have toilet paper tomorrow? <laughs> It, it can't get more simple than that. <laughs> can't get more simple than that. You know, and, and I really like what you said there. I mean, it is about that relation. The gospel is very simple. It's not very all simple. this, this person died and he never rose or that you got to do these 1700 things or it's just, right. and then once you're saved, once you have Jesus, it's simple. God says to obey. Right. And if we are walking in a relationship and we're studying his word and we have a relationship obeying, being patient and being kind and showing love and forgiving, it's not easy, but it's a right. hundred times more easy than when I'm not walking with God. Right. Well, you know, um, for some reason, people think that if they get saved, they're a Christian, that all of a sudden now things are supposed to be easy. And I don't know where they get that from. And, you know, um, I mean, would it be okay to say gracious. Joel Osteen? Would it be okay to say Joel Osteen, or that that might well, be a <laughs> hey hey? It's your podcast. I don't care what hey, you say. Body. Well, but there um, are preachers out there who yes. are giving that mentality of oh, if yes. you're a Christian, everything's going to be grand. Well, then when I go and do something for God and everything's not grand, well, God's let me down. Well, I can't really find a Bible character, and especially anybody in the Bible that did anything for the Lord. I can't find one that didn't have difficulty. And let me put it this way, even Jesus of all people had the most difficulty. So to somehow think that we're better than Jesus, that um, we're not supposed to have difficulty even though Jesus did, I think that's pretty arrogant, personally. Yeah, that gives me, gives me, especially being the week of Easter, that gives me chill bumps thinking about that. I mean, God says he's never gonna ask anything of us that Jesus has not already been, been willing to do. That's right. And here God asked his own son to die for a bunch of worthless wretches like you and me. Yep. And, you know, to think about that, that what Jesus did for us and that God asked him to do, and then all God's asking me to do is to love others and forgive others and be patient. I mean, that's a way lower than giving my life for someone else. Yes. And, and, and like, you know, I think, you know, the Bible, the Bible puts it this way. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It, it doesn't mean that there's not going to be a yoke and that there's not going to be a burden. But Jesus says with him, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It means this, that we don't have to bear that yoke and bear that burden alone. And, and, and that, that's, that's, that's the amazing thing. What we go through in life, we're going to have to go through whether we're a Christian or not most of the time. But to be able to go through it with Christ, what a difference that makes. And um, so, you know, I, I, would, I would encourage your listeners to be careful about thinking that, you know, they're going to pray a prayer, name something, you know, kind of name it and claim it. And that's going to take care of everything. And, and, and they're all of a sudden have a bunch of finances and everything's going to fall into place. Listen, you know, I just can't find that in the Bible other than somebody twisting a verse and making it say and mean something that it doesn't mean or say. You know, yep. my Bible tells me that the Bible makes it clear that if you love the Lord and serve the Lord, you shall suffer persecution. That's what the Bible says. So, you know, it, it just goes against the Bible. Well, you know, in modified, name it and claim it if it's God's will. I yeah. mean, 
that's that's the the the, the point they're missing there sure. is well, what i what i name and claim is god's word you know you just you claim you claim god's word god gave you his word you claim that that's fine but to right. claim god's word according to to you that's that's taking it out of bounds yes it would be taken out of god's word i mean you're you're, right. you're putting your own spin onto it and saying that's right you know god bless me financially it might not be god's will it might be right but it might well, god not. only promised and god only promised to meet our needs and um you know this thing of well you know god loves me more he's blessed me with more money or if god doesn't provide me with more money he doesn't love me as much no, 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 no. God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said his grace is sufficient. Um, he said that he would always, my God shall supply your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So God's never promised to make us wealthy. Some are, some aren't. And sometimes some people aren't because they've not been very wise with it. Now, I will tell you that the Bible gives clear principles that God honors those that are good stewards with what he does give. So th there is certainly that principle, but, you know, God just simply said that he, he would meet our needs. And, um, you know, so I think that's the only thing we have the right to hold God to is that, um, you know, it doesn't mean I go waste my money on everything else. And then all of a sudden I have a need. And now I say, well, God didn't supply that need. Oh yeah, he did. You just wasted it. You know? Yeah. You weren't a good steward. Right. Yeah. Well, brother, with the people who, um, you know, are, are stressed. I know e even as Christians, when times come along like this, um, you know, how am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to, you know, I'm, I'm not in work or, you know, for like Jordan and I, we're both self-employed. We right. have no businesses right now. Right. Everything, all my contracts, I've put them on, how, how can I do coaching for a business right. when their business is closed? Yeah. I mean, I guess I could send them an invoice, but it <laughs> probably wouldn't <laughs> be paid and probably be rude. Right. You know, what, what do we as Christians, cause that still can be, I mean, again, we're not, as you say, with the, the, the yoke, I mean, things are still going to come into our lives. So as we wrap up, what are some things that the believers, those who are, you know, have that relationship with Jesus Christ, what are a few things that they could focus on during a time like this to help themselves, their own mental and physical but those around them, I know our, our church verse last year was be an example. Right. You know, if we're miserable, what is our neighbor or what is our wife or our spouse or our kids? If we're stressed out, what kind of example are we going to be? So what can we do to encourage them during this time? Well, you know, I think I, I tend to always go back to a Bible verse. I tell people when I counsel with them, um, I don't just do newthetic counseling and things of that nature. I do biblical counseling. So it, it's got to come back down to the Bible. Sometimes people don't really want to hear the Bible. They just want to hear what they want to hear or they know what they want you to say. But it, if it doesn't come from the Bible, then I really can't claim that. And so I go to the verse um, that in Psalms, I mean, Proverbs, very simple verse, you know, delight thyself in the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And, you know, just three things in there that I see is, you know, first, delight thyself in the Lord, which means the Lord's got to be my greatest desire. And I need to desire the Lord, Nathan, if this makes sense, I've got to desire the Lord more than I desire my own safety right now. It doesn't mean I don't need to want to be safe. Yes, I do. And I want to take precautions and everything that I can do. But it means that I can't let my fear of that or circumstances rob me of my faith in the Lord. So I've got to delight myself in the Lord. And then the second thing he says, trust also in him. So I've got to just choose to trust. And, and here's the reason he says, because, and he shall bring it to pass. So that means that I, it's never my job to bring anything to pass. My job is to delight in the Lord and to trust him. That's my responsibility. So I would encourage, you know, those who might be listening, quit trying to figure out how you can make up for everything, how you can keep track of everything, how you can keep yourself safe, how you can make it through with the bills. Your job as a Christian, I believe God made it clear is you delight yourself in God and trust him. 
And, and if you do that, God says, I'll bring it to pass. It's just like, you know, he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So it's not your job to add the things unto you. God does that. You seek God first. And um, that's our job. So we've got to realize in the whole scheme of things, what is our responsibility and what is not. And the bringing things to pass is not my responsibility. It's just not what God has asked me to do. But what he has asked me to do is to delight myself in him and trust in him. And so right now at this time, I think of all times we need to show not just ourselves, but our children and the world around us that God is trustworthy right now. And so we've got to delight ourselves in him. He's got to be our encouragement through this and just trust him. And um, I think as God brings it to pass, as he promised he will, that will build our faith and build our faith and build our faith. Uh, we just got to do what God's asked us to do. And we can't worry about what God has not asked us to do. And this whole thing of bringing something to pass, God said that's his job. Yeah, so kind of in my thought process there, and tell me if I'm right or wrong on this, is it's a choice. It's a, it's a mental decision to, to say, yes. I'm going to lean on what, even though I don't understand it. I don't know why coronavirus is happening. I don't know what's going to, you know, tomorrow's going to hold or three weeks from now or six months from now but I know God's in control. Right. And, and that's, you know, that's when I, trust. That's it's trust that's for me. Ja you know, James, for me, James find joy in all circumstances. Right. I know this is not my final place. I know this is not my home. I know that I'm saved and no matter what happens, I know I'm right. going to heaven. Yep. Well, and you know, the Bible never says that we have to, um, have joy with our circumstances we're just supposed to have joy in our circumstances it means we don't necessarily have to be thrilled and happy of what's going on but in the midst of what's going on we can find joy in the lord because that the bible says is our strength and so right now we need to have the joy of the lord more than anything because we need strength right now and that's that delight thyself in the lord that's the joy of the lord and trust also in him and he'll bring it to pass. I mean, and, again, you talked about that word simplicity, that's simple. Yeah, simplicity. So then if we don't have that joy, if we're not delighting ourselves in the Lord, then we in kind of coming full circle, then we can't show the love of Christ to others because we don't have the joy that comes from God because we're not delighting in him. Therefore, we can't share the good news of right. what Jesus has done for us because even when we try to, it's going to come across, you know, you're sucking lemons, so your face looks horrible. How, is, how can someone say, like, hey, I want what that guy has or what that girl has if you look miserable all the time? Well, yeah. Well, you know, like in that verse, trust brings joy. Um, you know, you're not going to have a joyful marriage if a wife can't trust her husband and if a husband can't trust his wife. So, you know, delight thyself in the Lord, trust also in him. It is when you trust him, that brings joy in that relationship. And you're not going to have that joy if you're not trusting. And so the average Christian, Christian never has that joy because they haven't learned that trust. And, and because of that, you know, now they're start trying to make things happen and they're trying to bring things to pass. And, and, and the world and their friends and their family see that they're not trusting in the Lord. So he must not be trustworthy. And they don't have the joy of the Lord, so there must not be any joy, you know, with the Christian life. And then they're frantically stressed and trying to make everything happen, which then the world looks and says, why do I need Jesus if that's all he's doing for you? And so it, 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 it's simply, he will do it, but you have to let him. It's just, you know, delight yourself in the Lord, trust in him, he'll bring it to pass. It, you know, it's just that simple. Yep, it, it, it is really simple. I'm the one and you're the one and others are, we complicate it. We make it right. more about, Oh, this, that, and the other. I know I, it took me a long time to admit this to myself. I know why I have a hard time trusting the Lord because I have a hard time trusting myself. Right. I know I'm a liar at times. I know I exaggerate. I know, and I don't try to, Yep. it's just my human nature. And I try to catch it. You know, I got a bad attitude at times. I I'm snippy at times or I'm short. I, I try to correct it. 
So then when I look and say, you know, across my life, there's nobody in my life who has never done me wrong at some level. Right. So then I've got to think about when I've got to trust somebody that I've, you know, you know, physically never met per se. I have met, you know, through, through his nature and that of meeting God. And I think that's a part in people's minds that they, they don't make the connection is that one of the reasons they have a hard time trusting God is they have a hard time trusting themselves. Well, sure. Well, you know, that's why the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God because it is literally an act of faith to trust God, to trust God. You know, somebody I've not seen, I've not personally felt touched. I mean, I, I feel him spiritually, but I, you know, I've not, you know, he's not been at the foot of my bed and, you know, all those things. And, um, you know, that is an act of faith. And so I, I think that is to delight yourself in the Lord, even when things are not delightful, that takes faith. To trust in the Lord where you don't feel like anything is trustworthy, that's an act of faith. And God honors faith. He always has. And so God brings those things to pass based on the fact that your faith, you know, that's what the Bible says in the New Testament, according to your faith, God will do. And, and that is the fact, the more faith we show in God and the way faith manifests itself in our life is in trust. It means this, that if I have faith in a chair, I trust it by sitting down in it. And so that's how my trust is, is shown. I'll sit down. But my trust came because I had faith that the chair would hold me. So my faith in God displays in my life, it displays itself in trust. And so it is, God, I trust you. And um, I'm just going to leave this with you. I'm going to do everything that I can do. And I'm trusting you. And um, God said he'll bring it to pass. And, you know, He's the one that's, he's the one that's made the promise. Yeah. And that's where we're at in our society with everything going on today. We're going to have to trust God and have faith yeah. that he's going to do what he's promised in his that's word. Right. And this, right. that is to take care of us today. Right. Absolutely. And Brother, you know, I, oh, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, you know, it, it's all wrapped in a nutshell. Um, you'll find that the basic core principles of God's word, even including the gospel, usually have two or three steps. It, it's um, it, it's just amazing as you as you go through God's word and you break everything down to the core principle of everything God does. It's just two or three steps. It's simple, <clears throat> and you know the gospel is the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, and you know, um, I, I think that we have a tendency to overcomplicate it. Once man gets involved, man ruins it. That's just the way it is. So we've got to let God's word be God's word and um, let it control us, not us manipulating it. And, um, you know, just trust him. And that's all we, that's all we can do right now. And, and, um, but I, I, I'm encouraged. I've watched people do that right now and um, not only trust God, but they trust God enough to reach out to others also and help. And uh, that's been encouraging to me as a pastor. Well, and as we wrap up here, I, I know, I know you, and we've talked about this, but, you know, shutting down Kerwin when all this was first happening um, was a really hard decision for you. Sure. Um, but you had to put that trust and that faith that that was the right thing, that that was where we were heading, and you made right. the right choice on that. But I know it was something that really came down to a, tr a trust and faith for you. It is, and you know, it's 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 a prayer of, um, you know, there's just certain things aren't in our control, and um, I love the people at the church so very very much that I don't ever want to do anything that would put them in harm's way. And um, you know, I I got a I got a text this morning from a lady in our church who has a friend at work and her church continued with services and um, eight people in their church here in our local area, eight of those people at church have the coronavirus. Now it has started to really spread through that whole church. And she texted and just thanked me. She said, thank you for making the decisions you made. You know, I think that some churches really fought against it because the government handed down this mandate. And the church sometimes believes the government's just against them and after them and all that, you know, and even the state when they hand down mandates. And you know what? I think at some point I'm a pastor and I'm supposed to show trust. 
And I think God's bigger than our government. And I think God's bigger than our state. And, you know, if, if, um, if this is a step we need to take to keep our people safe, I got to trust God to keep this church going. It's his church, not my church. It, you know, this church was going on before I got here. It'll be going on after I leave. It's not mine. It's God. So, you know what? I, I really haven't struggled with the decision. It, it, uh, I felt safe about it. I felt right about it. I got to worry about liability at our church and I want our people to be safe. And so, you know, a lot of churches have done just like we've done. Um, we've just tried to be sensible about this. Uh, there's always a, a Wahoo out there that decides he's going to show his spirituality by bucking against, you know, every authority out there. And that's just not what our world needs right now, to be honest with you. Um, of all things, the world should see from us people that um, are sensible and balanced and um, can trust the Lord through something like this. So uh, the Lord certainly honored those decisions. Absolutely. A excellent point on that. So as we wrap up, if somebody wants to find out more about uh, you and your church, um, both from a, a dot com and, and TV and radio, where can they find out more information about the preaching well, and I, your ministry? Yeah, I think the best place is just, uh, you know, our church website, CurlinBaptistChurch.com. Um, it has, you know, all of our TV broadcast and, of course, live streaming services, archives and, and things of that nature. Um, you know, I haven't gone the route of doing a personal website or anything uh, yet at this point. I'm just still um, trying to keep my head above water, pastoring a wonderful church, you know, but, um, you know, anything we could maybe try to do to help pray or whatever, we'd be glad to try to um, help out. And, you know, we certainly don't have the answers anymore than anyone else. And by the way, you cracked me up earlier, you, you know, you were talking about our our radio ministry and website, you said, how many people have been saved through your radio ministry and Adrian Rogers and, and uh, Billy Graham and all that. And I thought, yeah, between all of us, we've really seen a lot of people saved <laughs> over the years. It doesn't hurt that you got Billy Graham and uh, Adrian Rogers in that mix. And we're, you know, goodness gracious, we're, we're doing nothing compared to what those great men of God did. But uh, we're just glad for the little corner God's carved out for us. And we're going to try our best to, to serve him the best we can. Yeah, but you never know, and 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 during this yeah, time, you never know. with especially with everything going on right now, you never know what sharing that post or sharing sure. your story or sharing uh, you know somebody's devotional. I know you've been doing daily devotionals, both video and in text. You never right. know what the Holy Spirit can do when you share that one thing, because you might catch that person at the moment where life is just caving in on them. They have no other choices, and then. Here's someone giving them the gospel. Yes. I, well, you know, I, I got a card today from a lady in Pennsylvania. don't know how it got to her. She's been watching our, our services online um, in the past two months. And then our daily videos that I've been sending out, believing together and things. And, um, you know, man, I don't even know how she got, but just thank me for the ministry. She needed it the most. And I had a guy in Michigan that sent that and stuff. So, uh, you know, I, I, it gets around. That's, that's, the, that's the miracle of technology. You know, us having a special needs child that need that needs so much prayer and at times uh, and always will have seasons in his life where he needs prayer. It has been a huge blessing, uh, you know, social media technology to get people out praying. I don't have a lot of that particular social media, but I uh, mean, I'm glad the people that do. And, and you know, I, I thank God for it. And like I said, if God can use something, I'm for it. I, I really am. And. Um, you know, I appreciate you, Nathan, and, and the journey you've had and um, the ground you've um, made in your life and, and the maturing of your ministry and all that you're doing. Um, God's really opened some some wonderful doors for you. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to see what God's doing. Well, I appreciate that, brother. I appreciate that a lot. So I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, to do this. And if you um, want to learn more about uh, Pastor Haltry and Kerwin, the website's Kerwin Baptist church.com and i'll put that uh in the notes as well of the podcast and if you want to learn more about handling life you can visit handlinglife.org